I think there certainly could be great games. Uh, you know, certainly it's not the case that I personally or Amnesty feel that at the moment Qatar should be boycotted. Um, it's an incredible opportunity, one that is, you know, in a way, once in a lifetime. You know, to give you a sense of context, this problem with migrant labor abuse and other human rights problems in the region, they're not new. That problem has been there for some decades. But the World Cup has put this pressure on Qatar in a way that we've never seen before. Um, the kind of conversations that I have in Qatar, you know, meeting the government and with companies are ones that normally these are people who never want to speak to people like me. So uh, there definitely is hope. But quite frankly, we haven't seen enough change. Uh, there's no question that there's been some progress, but really not, not, not enough. So according to the um, Qatar Bureau of Statistics, the, the number is somewhere between 250 to 300,000 Qatari nationals. Um, and so the remainder of the population, so about 1.5, 1.6 million people are migrant workers. Not all of them are construction workers or domestic workers, although most are, but you have other professionals as well. So in fact, something like 80, 90% of the population is a migrant. Yeah, I don't have an exact um, figure on me. In fact, you know, no one really has an exact figure. It's, the reporting is not that good on that. But you're looking at hundreds of thousands of workers, at least, if not more than that. And I'm really glad that you mentioned stadiums plus roads and other things, because often what you hear is that, you know, there's only thousands of workers um, working on World Cup stadiums, and they're generally in a good condition. But in fact, if you include the many other workers building hotels that fans will stay in, the parks that fans will enjoy, the roads, the rail lines. In fact, yes, it's literally hundreds of thousands of workers and um, not including domestic workers, just to do with the World Cup Direct. Most of these are men, men uh, that you'll see in the camps that it's a very odd sight to see these people sort of ripped from their societies, from their families and stuck in these desolate camps doing very difficult jobs in very hot temperatures, uh, building, uh, living very, very in a very poor way in a very wealthy country. There's something very surreal and very wrong about that. Oh, yes, very much so. I mean, Amnesty as an organization has been, since 2012, doing quite a bit of research and visits in Qatar. This year alone, I've spoken to about 250 individual workers and documented over 300 individual cases all migrant workers uh, visiting their camps, visiting where they work, visiting them in public spaces. And um, yeah, so it, it really is quite heartbreaking when you meet these people and, and really the demands and the kinds of things they talk about are the types of things that all of us want and take for granted. You know, to visit your family on a holiday, um, to see your children, to be get paid on time and, and to be paid what and to have conditions and pay as you agreed with your employer um, to not be harassed by the police. Yeah, I mean, um, you know, slavery has a certain definition on international law. I mean, certainly some of the conditions would be considered slavery, but at the very minimum, you're looking at what you describe as forced labor. So the average migrant worker doesn't even have their own passport. They need to get permission from the employer to change jobs or even to, just to leave the country. So these are people living in forced labor conditions. And you can imagine with that kind of a power imbalance, if they're not happy with their uh, treatment, uh, they, the, they can very easily be punished by their employer. So it's a very terrible situation. Yeah, look, I mean, some do. Some have actually worked in the region or in other countries like Malaysia for a long time and they're simply desperate. Um, they need money, there isn't enough jobs in their home country, uh, and they go. But many others actually have no idea. And there's often a sense that, you know, working um, overseas is prestigious, and that, um, you know, people will respect you more. But then they've got no idea about what they are about to go into. And when they meet with the recruiters back home in places like Nepal, or in, you know, Cameroon, or in India, Bangladesh, um, they're told one thing, and when they get into Qatar, in fact, they discover that the situation is very different. 
So absolutely, uh, you have many workers. Uh, I've interviewed so many that are really in a state of shock at just how difficult things are. And they basically feel that they've been completely misled uh, about the situation. The most striking ones to me are um, ones involving children or, you know, uh, very young men. Um, uh, now, I, I stress that in my time, sadly, I haven't had a chance to do much research on domestic workers, but there are some cases there which are really shocking too. But, you know, one thing that really comes to mind, a particular case was we uh, visited a really appalling camp with about 200 workers in it in the industrial area outside Doha. So it's a dusty desert area with these, you know, very basic buildings. And I was surrounded by workers talking about, you know, how bad their life is and filthy toilets and filthy kitchen area, you know, up to 10 men living in one small room. And, um, you know, they would not let us leave. And then actually the, the camp boss called the police and the police actually briefly detained me. And as the police were taking me away, you know, literally there were 100 workers standing outside the camp watching me go away. And the look of, you know, sadness and disappointment in their faces was really heartbreaking because, as you know, it's one thing to be in a very bad situation. It's, it's even worse to lose a sense of hope. And in some respects, you know, our job is to give these people hope. No, it's not all bad news. Um, we've seen actually that some companies have voluntarily uh, set up what they call worker welfare standards. Uh, Qatar Foundation is one example. There's another company called CH2M Hill, which um, is the manager, the project manager of the World Cup. It doesn't itself hire labor. And what they've tried to do with these standards is to make sure that workers have basic, you know, uh, conditions, good conditions for their life. Um, now, these are actually small steps. Uh, most workers do not enjoy these kinds of things. But there's no question that that is a very good story. And those are the sorts of things that need to be built upon. Sadly, you would think that they would be. But, you know, such as the, the genius of the system, the Kafala sponsorship system that operates in Qatar and the UAE and many other countries, it kind of puts in all these checks and balances to make it very difficult for workers to organize. Um, now, you do have instances where workers organize um, spontaneously. And the state, in not just Qatar, many countries like UAE, is very quick to deport um, the workers. You had one case in the UAE where a bunch of Bangladeshi workers refused to work uh, and uh, they got many other workers to stop. And it got to the point, and they were very organized. And so the company said that they would agree to talk to them. And when the leaders of the uh, workers came to meet them, it turned out there was, uh, you know, masked policemen waiting to basically arrest them and chuck them back home. So those are the kind of challenges that they face. Another issue is that workers generally are kept on these two-year visas. And when you finish that visa time, you can't come back to Qatar for two years. So what that does is it sort of automatically may, means that the workforce is constantly changing. Um, the workers come from different regions. They'll often mix workers from different uh, languages or dialects together. So they're not very easily organizing with each other. And so, in fact, we find that it's very difficult for workers to do that. And of course, under Qatar law, workers are not allowed to form or join a, a union, you know, so... Um, there are profound challenges there, but it's a really good point you make. This is a key thing. Um, we can talk about the situation for workers, but that's why we've been calling on Qatar to uh, give workers the right to form or join unions. That's a really key part of improving their rights. To be perfectly honest with you, I think we've hit a bit of a brick wall. I think that we're not having the kind of engagement with the Qatar government that we used to have. And that's why our thinking is very much now to be targeting Qatar's partners, uh, particularly FIFA and the large companies, because the reality is the World Cup is the key leverage point we've got. The construction will happen even if the World Cup goes, workers will face abuse even if the World Cup goes. But the World Cup gives, gives us an opportunity to put pressure on Qatar 
But like all opportunities, nothing is set in stone. Unless we fight hard to, to make it a reality, then, you know, unfortunately, we've got millions of workers who will be facing abuse for a long time. Thank you.